This is probably not going to surprise most of you, but the initial experience of residential schools for most students starts with not very good. Um, and that's partially because the experience of going to residential school for a lot of Indigenous students is pretty traumatic. Um, in the sense that they are being separated from their family, they're being placed in an environment where they really can't communicate with anyone in charge because most of the people who run these schools don't speak indigenous languages. Um, they are often separated from their siblings, they're sort of placed in environments that sort of don't respect that. And that's the case even when you have parents who agreed to send their, their children to residential schools. Um, Sometimes parents did agree on the sort of belief that they would be getting a better education than they could get here and indigenous parents are just like any other parents and that they want what's best for their children. So there are some people who do agree, some parents who do agree to that, not all of them. And in that case, you have, for example, cases of things like the RCMP showing up in a community with child sized handcuffs um, and sort of being handcuffed by the RCMP and then flown out of your community to go hundreds of miles away is kind of an example of something that maybe um, isn't the sort of best thing for sort of starting a solid educational relationship. These are children who are experiencing that kind of trauma of being pulled from their families like that. Um, and that is really important to understand that the separations from, the fam from family are often very, very long. Um, in that visits are rarely allowed and there's a lot of attempts in order to ensure that kind of cultural assimilation that children don't visit home and parents don't visit schools to say nothing of the fact that these schools are often hundreds of kilometers away from a, a child's home community which makes the sort of practical aspects of visiting very 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 difficult letters are possible but if i can only write in english and my mother only speaks cree how do i send her a letter um, and even if I do send her a letter, the people who run the school that I'm attending are also going to be sort of monitoring and censoring that letter. So I can't say the things that I want. And in any event, if my mother writes a letter back to me and she's not writing that letter in English, they won't give it to me. Um, and that's really important because you need to understand that in a lot of these schools, the use of indigenous language is forbidden. Um, and I sort of usually sort of approach this by talking to my students who have experience going through immersion education because there are some students who tend to sort of think that like, yeah, I went to a school where I was not allowed to speak English either and like that was sort of French immersion and if you think about that sort of promise like, I remember going through French immersion as in, in elementary school and getting told, for example, that if I spoke English too much, they might cancel my recess once a week or something like that. Um, and that really sucks when you're in third grade and all you want to do is run around outside. Um, but that's not what we're talking about in terms of the prohibition on the use of indigenous language. Um, there are some really, really, really horrendously graphic stories about this process. So, for example, um, you'll hear stories of children who have pins and needles stuck through their tongues um, for using indigenous languages. You'll have unit, you have children who have been given corporal punishment, so they have been beaten or hit for using indigenous languages. Um, and on top of that, the way that the schools are structured in a lot of ways, they're bringing in children from a variety of different communities intentionally. Um, because that way they don't they can't speak to each other either um, and so there's there's some really supreme isolation in terms of those experiences that are important to understand um, and then there are also some sort of challenges just in terms of the connection to this sort of process so one of the things that many of the adults who ran residential schools were concerned about was the idea that indigenous boys were sort of exhibiting what was understood as like feminine traits, particularly um, through having hair that was too long. Okay, so it was quite common for um, children to arrive at residential schools and one of the first things that sort of happens is similar to sort of going into prison uh, you get like a delousing shower to make sure you don't have lice um, and then they cut your hair and that is a difficult enough experience when we talk about it in a prison context um, but when we talk about it in relation to indigenous communities it's really important to understand that for many indigenous communities Cutting your hair is a punishment or an expression of extreme grief. 
So, for example, if you commit an offense against the community, um, you sort of betray a friend, you refuse to share a hunt, something like that. You do something that is a harm to your community and you need to be ashamed of, and everyone around you needs to know that you've done something bad, they cut your hair. Uh, likewise, in some communities, if, for example, you have lost a very close relative, if your parents or your siblings or your grandparents have passed away, you cut your hair in a gesture of mourning. And that means that when you have children who don't understand the adults around them who show up and the first thing they do is cut their hair is you have a bunch of children who think either they have lost someone really, really important to them or they have broken some kind of very serious rule that they can't figure out because they've just been punished by having their hair cut and that's the environment in which they are starting their school their education in this sort of context um, that's sort of part of this experience another challenge that sort of comes out of this in terms of what's going on in terms of the experience at these schools um, is about what is being taught so if you remember, we talked about most of these schools being managed by church organizations. And if you think about it, for the most part, the primary concern of those church organizations is, by and large, converting people to Christianity or Catholicism, depending on the sort of flavor. And that becomes way more important. So you'll hear, you sort of look at a lot of the data and a lot of the evidence that sort of suggests that, like, you know, half of your day is spent like a good third of your day is spent learning catechism, learning sort of religious scriptures and prayers and all that sort of stuff. And then you have the other half of your day that's spent doing piecework sewing or work on a farm, which means you have this teeny tiny sliver left to do all kinds of like language acquisition and history and science and all of those sort of actual academic schedules, sort of pieces, mathematics, that sort of thing. Um, and there's an argument about that. Um, that part of that is because of the poorly qualified teachers, okay? It is absolutely possible to do things like teach really interesting ideas about meter and language and communication and persuasion and grammar and all of those things through religious texts. It's possible. There are many schools that do it in a contemporary context. You know, you'll sort of read the book of Genesis as a conversation around how we find meaning in our own world. Like you can do some really cool stuff with that, but you need to be a trained teacher. And because you have to sort of really think about what am I trying to teach? How am I going to use this text to do this? What am I going to ask students to do? What supports do they need to do those things? That's a lot of work and it's sort of a specialist's job. Um, and it's much easier to stand in front of a classroom and force students to memorize by rote, say, Our Father Who Art in Heaven, or to memorize the Hail Mary or the Stations of the Cross or any of those sorts of religious pieces. Um, and it's important to understand that for the most better part of this period, that's how catechism is taught to every child. Every child is taught essentially to memorize and repeat back um, religious doctrine because that's how that was taught. That's how the teaching sort of happened. Um, so there's a lot of this sort of educational experience that's actually done through that sort of like sit in your desk and memorize this text kind of way. And those of you who have experienced that, that's not the most fun way of learning things or the most sort of exciting one. Um, but there's also some other challenges in that sort of process in that one of the things that I can tell you and one of the things that I study outside of Canadian history is a lot of stuff about education. And one of the things that sort of predicts how well my students are going to do in my classes is whether or not I think they're going to do well. So if you come into my class and my impression of you is that like you're probably an A student, you're likely to do better in my class than if you come in and for whatever reason I sort of go, mm, you're a C student because my interactions with you are going to be different, the way that I approach you are go is going to be different, um, the ideas I have and the questions that I ask you are going to be different, right? Like if I think you're capable of getting the correct answer and you give me a wrong one, um, one of my responses will be, and this is not sort of about me, this is about all of the data we find sort of in teachers, is that if I expect you to be able to answer that question, then the first thing I'm going to do when you give me a wrong answer is ask you, how did you get there? And I'm going to ask you to figure out, like to map out your thinking, 
And then I can look at your thinking and go, oh, you missed this part in step three. I can correct your thinking there, and then you can get the rest of it. And that kind of process is actually really helpful for getting you to learn things because you have identified what the problem in your thinking is, and so you've been able to fix the problem. If I think that you're not capable of getting the wrong answer, the right answer, and you give me a wrong one, I'm likely to just be like, mm, on to the next student and I'll ask someone else. And that kind of low expectation about ability is really, really, really important to understand, right? When we combine that with ideas about ethnocentrism, when we combine that with ideas about poorly trained teachers, what you wind up with is a lot of teachers teaching students they fundamentally kind of thought were dumb. Um, and they thought that they were dumb because, for example, these students don't speak the correct language, right? And like, you're asking them questions in English and they don't speak English, so they're not giving you the right answer, or they don't speak really, really good English, right? So there's some conversations around sort of that kind of expectation. Um, and then another piece that sort of comes into this kind of experience about sort of the teaching experience um, is also, again, connected to that idea about expectations. So there's an argument, and it is not one that it is easy to prove one way or the other, but there is an argument that part of what's happening when we talk about teachers um, in residential schools and just sort of the general European population of the country was that, yes, there was going to be a process by which indigenous children would come to participate in Western society, okay? That they were going to do that. But coupled with that is also an idea about how they are going to participate in that society, right? So there's an idea, for example, that like, well, they're probably going to be farmhands, they're not going to own the farm. Or, well, they're probably going to work as sort of maidservants and not necessarily be, you know, the mayor's wife, okay? And if you take those assumptions and you map them onto what is actually happening in terms of the experience of residential schools, you sort of, it sort of makes sense, right? If all I'm expecting you to do as a teacher is become a farmhand, then it makes a lot of sense that you spend half of your day working on a farm because that's preparing you for the job I think you're actually going to have. The challenge is that the education that I give you to become a farmhand doesn't ever really let you do things like become a doctor um, because you didn't get the math, you didn't get the science, you didn't get the background, you didn't get the cultural capital to get you through the med school interviews. All of that stuff is missing. Um, and so there's like a, there's a pretty solid argument that our residential schools in this country were really set up to sort of maintain indigenous people in a subservient position. Okay. So that's part of it. Um, the last thing I sort of want to talk about in terms of this experience, and I'm going to have to make a separate video about abuses, but that's next. That's fine. Um, the other thing I sort of want to talk about is that in a lot of ways, that sort of experience about not having enough food that we talked about in our last video um, is partially connected to funding but it's also fundamentally connected to some, we'll go with questionable ethical decisions made on the part of um, many school administrators. So we have some documented cases, for example, in British Columbia, where there were residential schools that knowingly signed up their students without the students knowing to participate in experiments on malnutrition i.e. they had dietitians from the university design diets that were intentionally deficient in a particular vitamin, a particular mineral, and then they just sat back and watched what happened. Um, and the doctors and the sort of researchers who were running that thought that that was an acceptable kind of thing because from their perspective, even if there's negative consequences of this, these children are still receiving an edifying and improving experience because they're getting access to Western culture and Western education. Uh, nobody asks these children if they want Western culture or Western education. Nobody asks their parents. There's some challenges in that sort of space. Um, but I want you to understand that in some ways, the difficult experiences of residential schools are structural. Like there's no way around that being a negative experience, even before we get to the potential for um, abuse. And sort of it may sound, for example, like sticking the needle through someone's tongue for speaking an indigenous language um, is an example of abuse. But I also want to remind you that, I mean, there are many schools at the same sort of time period where it was quite acceptable for corporal punishment to be levied on children. My father will tell you about um, 
having bloody scars across his hand because he was left-handed um, and so when he wrote with his left hand the nuns would slap his hand so he sort of learned to write with his right write with his right hand um, and my father's not that old um, so like do be aware that some of these things are like contextually changed <laughs>